Can we talk Ultimate Series McLarens? The one behind me is the latest. It's called the McLaren Senna, and if you call a car Senna, it had better be good. Fortunately, it is, and it is the follow-up to this, which is the P1. You'll remember one of the holy trinity of hypercars alongside the LaFerrari and the Porsche 918 Spider. Now, I mention Ultimate Series McLarens today and this week in particular because 25 years ago this week we tested the McLaren that started it all. Now it wasn't an Ultimate Series because there wasn't a series of McLarens then, it was the one, the only McLaren road car of the time, it was the F1. this film then we're going to try and put this extraordinary lineage into some kind of context by driving the F1, P1 and Senna back to back. Now we can't bring you a film on Ultimate Series McLarens every week, much as we'd like to, but this is part of an ongoing Autocar Heroes series that looks back at some of our favourite cars of all time. So hit subscribe below, turn on notifications and you'll never miss one. The Autocar invented the road test. We did the first one in 1928 and we've been measuring, weighing, accelerating, lapping and braking vehicles every week ever since. I mean, I don't mean braking, braking, obviously. McLaren would only ever allow one set of independent numbers to be put against the F1. So 25 years ago, we made the case that it should be us, inventors of the road test, who should obtain them. And McLaren agreed. So this is it then, this is where the modern era McLaren road cars, if you like, started. And all right, we haven't done the old road going McLarens of Bruce McLaren's era, and we haven't done the Mercedes, the McMurk SLR. I think the lineage really for Ultimate Series goes F1, P1, Senna. So we'll see what they're like in a minute. But for now, my God, what a place to be. And actually, what a lovely place to be. This car is 25 years old. This is the very chassis, XP5, the very car that did autocars, road test numbers. And it was here at Bruntingthorpe Proving Ground where we are today that Autocar took XP5 to over 200 miles an hour in 1994. McLaren estimates there are only five or six F1s in regular use today of the 64 that were built. This isn't one of them. XP5 was McLaren's experimental prototype, hence XP, and has come out of storage for this story after three years. It's the very same car that was driven by Andy Wallace at Air Alessian in Germany to record a world record-breaking 243 mile an hour top speed. Today, XP5 is valued at something like 25 million pounds. Well, I'm just cruising to get used to it, but it's so lovely. The driving position is spot on. It doesn't feel weird being in the middle. You get these wonderful little seats that actually, so I can take two people if I want to. Visibility is absolutely terrific. Got a mirror here, mirror here, two on the outside as well. So although I can't see straight over my head, I've got really, really strong visibility. Small pillars, big window area. And everything's just so easy because the control weights are just so perfect. The throttle pedal is a tiny bit sticky, but there's a real heft to everything, a real linear heft to everything because everything is unassisted. Behind that famous three-seat cockpit, there is a naturally aspirated 6.1-litre V12 built by BMW Motorsport. That was BMW's task, make it 100 horsepower per litre. Well, they exceeded that. It's got 627 horsepower from its 6.1 litres and more than 479 pounds-foot of torque, all the way from 4,000 to 7,000 RPM. There is a tiny aluminium flywheel on it and it drives through a six-speed manual gearbox. The steering is unassisted because the car, I think when we weighed it, it was about 1,100 kilos with half a tank of fuel. So the original target was 1,000 kilos. The team led by Gordon Murray just missed that, but not by a great deal. There are double wishbones at each corner, anti-roll bars front and back and fat tyres on each wheel. Originally, the F1 ran custom-made Goodyear 23545 section rubber at the front and 31545 behind. But now XP5 runs on Michelins built to replicate the original tyres properties. And you can tell the minute you turn this unassisted wheel, you can tell this is a light car. Imagine a car with a six-litre engine today managing to be as light as that. 
it's unthinkable, literally unthinkable. The packaging is in this is really very good. Gordon Murray's a tall man, he can get in this easily. When you see it with the doors up, ingress is actually very easy, but there are two structural carbon fibre rails that you have to hoik yourself over, which means it's a little difficult to get into the middle seat. Every McLaren since this has been carbon fibre. The driving position is dead straight, the seat goes backwards and forwards, but the steering wheel does not move. More on that engine at the moment. And it means that everything is right within easy reach. I mean, as a driving environment, it's really terrific. Gordon Murray set out to build the greatest road car of all time. He didn't set out to build the fastest car of all time. It was just supposed to be the greatest road car. Now, reason number one that we're not out testing this car on the public road is the fact that this car is worth about 25 million pounds. Reason number two, That's at three to 5,000 RPM in third on a very light throttle. We've got a kilometre per hour speedometer. And let's just hear. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my giddy on. The response of that going up and coming down as well, I mean on downshifts. The throttle response on that is off the scale. Oh my goodness. Let's just take that through the gears again, I think, because why not? There was a German banker, Thomas Bescher, who had one of these. He was one of the guys who came up with the idea of racing one, in fact. And there was a time in the sort of mid-1990s when he took it in for a service and then he got a phone call from Woking and the McLaren HQ said, look, Thomas, there appears to be something wrong with your F1 because the black box keeps showing up these numbers every single day and nobody else finds this. I think there may be something wrong with it. Numbers like 220 miles an hour, 215 miles an hour, just happens daily. And he went, yeah, I use it to commute to work. I go in the autobahn, I do it every day, and I wring the absolute neck of it every single day. And you know what? You would. It is absolutely, unbelievably compelling to the extent that I'm just about to say, I think this is the best car I have ever driven. It sort of, it has stuff that you don't get in today's cars. That engine response, maybe a Ferrari has it, maybe a Lamborghini has it, but what it doesn't do, they do not combine it with that manual gear shift, this central driving position, this nimbleness and compactness. And modern Ferrari does feel agile because the steering's heavily assisted and very light. They really do change direction amazingly well. But this just has a raw honesty about everything. Now, clearly we can't launch this car from rest. The insurance sum is already mind-blowing and clutches on F1s are expensive. Well, like, really expensive. They contain carbon and they wear out extremely quickly. So we can't do a full standing start even though this car has been beautifully maintained by McLaren. It's just not, you just can't do it. But what I will do is run it through the gears from a rolling start and I'll read some numbers on the speedo and we'll give you the numbers that this car achieved in 1994 against the stopwatch. Actually, I have it at home, the sheet of paper that got printed out from its run. The numbers are very small and the speeds get big very quickly. So this is second gear at just over 2000 RPM. I don't know if it'll take full throttle, I think it will. Oh, so that's 180 k's. Can't look at the speedo because it runs into the rev limiter. 220 k's. 
not alive. The F1 accelerates from 0 to 60 miles an hour in 3.2 seconds, to 100 in 6.3, to 150 in 12.8, to 170 in just 17.2 seconds, and it'll pass a standing quarter mile in 11 seconds at 138 miles an hour. Now bear in mind it has no traction control, no launch control, requires four power off gear changes with a manual shift and even so between 0 and 170 miles an hour it is only 1.5 seconds slower than a McLaren 720S. Oh, and once you get a bit of heat into the brakes and you start to lean on the pedal a bit more, oh god it's just perfect. <laughs> So let's go and look at the other two, sit in them, see what they're like, feel the speed. I mean, if they're anything like as good as this, my God. 20 years after the road test of the F1, in 2014, Autocar road tested the McLaren P1. And, my God, it is loud and it is stiff. There are loads of different modes you can select in here. I've put it in race, which whacks down the suspension and it whacks up the rear wing because, well, if you're going to be in a P1, you might as well have the full angry experience. And it is slightly hard to believe this car is seven years old because it still feels so fresh and so modern and so complicated. And what I love about this car, what I loved about it when it was new and what I love about it still now, all of the engineering complexity was really genuinely put in your face for you to explore. So, as well as McLaren's usual slightly over complex modes of putting the car into its different gearbox and transmission and suspension settings, it also has another couple of buttons. One is race, but there's also this tremendously cool boost function. So if I press boost, a little light comes on and it limits the amount of power I'm getting to just the engine power and then I actually, actually have to pass, push a like push to pass button to get the full electric boost as well. You can even put the car into E mode and drive it on its electric motor alone. Unlike some hybrid cars which kind of try to disguise the fact that they are part electrified, McLaren just went absolutely to town for in this and said, yeah, if you want to feel it, we will let you feel absolutely everything in each individual mode. The P1 is powered by a twin-turbo 3.8-litre V8, although similar to that in other McLarens we saw before and after it, the block is unique, strengthened and modified to accommodate a hybrid electric motor. On its own, the flat-plane crank V8 generates 727 horsepower. The electric motor adds another 176 horsepower, making a fairly staggering 903 horsepower total. This means the P1's engine is more than two litres smaller than the one in the F1, yet the car produces 276 more horsepower. Oh my God. That is fast. That is, that's really fast. Oh, I've also got a drag reduction system button, because F1 was all about drag reduction at the time. It still feels such a special, special car. Completely unique. So, I don't know if you remember the Ferrari around those three hypercars. The 918, we road tested at Autocar, and it was quicker round a circuit than this car, which we also road tested. We never managed to road test the LaFerrari. In fact, sadly, I didn't get to drive the LaFerrari at all. But if it comes down to 918 or P1, my favourite and I believe the favourite of a lot of those who have tried them all. The P1 is such an astonishingly special thing. And it's so quick. God, that is so, so quick. But also it steers absolutely beautifully. Power assisted, unlike the F1. Power brakes, unlike the F1. And of course a flat plane crank with turbochargers doesn't quite make the same noise as a naturally aspirated V12, but I love the fact that you get all of the whistles and the zings and the whooshes and everything you hear from the turbochargers and the electric assistance, and it's just left bare for you to see. And in, in a similar fashion to the interior, which has this big swooping but obviously very structural carbon fibre everywhere, what the P1 does and what I think is 
the really special thing about all of these limited run McLarens is that they just present the engineer in your face and go, there you go, see, feel, and enjoy that. And it's so, so fast. It's so, so fast. How fast exactly? Well, 20 years on from the F1, it's a testament to that car's performance that it is still a relevant benchmark, but the P1 is a bit quicker everywhere. 0-60 to takes 2.8 seconds, 100 just 5.2 seconds, and it'll deal with a standing quarter mile in 10.2 seconds, that's about 0.8 of a second faster than the F1, at 147.5 miles an hour. That's 10 miles an hour faster. For the road test, it was the fastest thing that we had driven to that point and I remember doing the laps. Sometimes when you get in a car and you do some laps and you get to the end and you think, I'd quite happily stay out all day doing those. Sometimes you're sort of glad to hand the car back over. And the P1, you end up sort of slightly torn and thinking, I would really love to have the ability, the money to run a car like this all day, every day just chip away at a lap time and any time you do a track day Christ, you would just take this and have the time of your life but to the same extent when it boosts it boosts quite big and although it's docile although it's playable although it feels in a way like a massive great go-kart with loads of adjustability it's also a very very serious piece of kit god I love it to bits I really do love it to bits, this car. I'm not a fan of all new supercars and hypercars. I don't think they all offer something special. God, this is so lovely even today. It feels fantastic. Oh, God, that's so good. It's a very different experience to an F1. Another five years after the P1 road test, I have a Senna in race mode and ready to go. So let's put it in manual just at low speeds over the rattles. It's pinging up the stones and so on and so forth. This feels like a stripped out car. Does it feel as special inside as a P1? I don't know, there's no logical reason why it doesn't. But somehow, it isn't. It's just as loud, but the noise it is making is the McLaren V8 noise. Whereas in the P1 you get the whooshes, the boosts, the fizzes, the pops, the wheezes. A more two-dimensional feel to the centre. But that said, it does feel tied down and race raw and light. Light on its feet. Weighing just 1,375 kilos, this is a car that is lighter than a P1, although not as light as an F1. That's just the inevitability of modern vehicles. And its size. It's a spacious car, it's a comfortable car. I've got a good driving position. In some ways it feels like a 720S turned up to the maximum rather than a completely standalone model. And I know even a P1 isn't a completely standalone because it uses the carbon tub, it has the V8 basis, but somehow it feels like its own thing. The Senna, rather than feeling like its own thing, feels like an extension. The acceleration in the P1 felt remarkably urgent. You know what, this might even be louder than a P1. I've got harnesses rattling, which probably doesn't help. But let's get into a low gear and give this everything. Oh yeah, okay. That's 100. Yeah, okay, fine. That's from a low gear to about 150. But it just does it in brutal linearity and real, it just, in a sense that there's very little inertia, it just picks up and it goes. It really is something. The Senna's acceleration times then are 0 to 60 in 3.1 seconds, 0 to 100 in 5.5, 0 to 170 miles an hour in 15.4, and a standing quarter of 10.4 seconds at 148.2 miles an hour, just a fraction slower than a P1. But it's worth remembering that the Senna was more about lap times than straight line acceleration. Hence its lightweight, huge aero, and the fact that it went round our handling circuit for our road test far quicker than the P1. It feels like the sort of car that gets better and better 
the faster you are prepared to push it. What does it rev to? I can barely see because it gets round there so quick. I mean, it's all of 800 horsepower. So it's revving pretty much to 8,000. It's a mind bending speed, but whereas in a P1, what strikes you is all of that raw, interesting engineering presented in your face that makes it fun at 20 miles an hour in the same way that it's fun at 150, 160 miles an hour. Although there's stuff to enjoy about the Senna if you're not absolutely on it, what it does is really comes alive when you absolutely are. What an amazing car. The immediacy and the urgency are fabulous and then take all of the lack of refinement and just put it out of your mind as you would in a racing car. I mean, those downshifts are fabulous. The brakes are brilliant. The driving position's good and the steering. Remember, McLaren retains hydraulic steering. I know the F1 had no power assistance at all, but they still retain hydraulic power assistance today because it just offers you a certain amount of feel and feedback that you McLaren thinks you can't get from an e-pass system. It's special and unique in its own way, this car. It doesn't feel as special to me as a, as a, as a P1 or an F1, but I think we'll get back in the F1 and have some kind of conclusion. Back into it like an old pair of slippers. Well, uh, actually, like your, like your best trainers, just fits immediately, it just feels so natural, it just feels so wonderful. It's much less raw than the other two, particularly the Senna, and it's involving and engaging. I and mean, they're amazingly fast. I love the P1, absolutely adore the P1. I love how much engineering is in your face and left just open for you to feel. And I like the rawness in the Senna and that it gets better as it gets faster. And I suspect if you said, well, here's a race circuit, here are the three cars, go as fast as you can. Which are you going to pick? Well, you might not pick the F1 first. You might pick the Senna first, then the P1, then the F1. But if you said to a car person, which is the best driver's car? Which gives you the, the biggest feeling that you are in something impossibly special? There's only one answer. In 1994, when my colleagues road tested this car, they said, well, we may never see anything else like it. We may never see a car this fast again. Well, it took a little while, but we did see cars that fast again. And now the power levels of this car, its acceleration, in gear, off the line, even top speed. There are a few cars around that better it. But in terms of feel and involvement and engagement, and drivability and just how sodding easy it is to absolutely love it's just I have never driven a car as great as this Now, we can't promise you Ultimate Series McLarens every week, but if you've enjoyed this, please consider giving us an up thumb, subscribing, or turning on notifications so that you will never miss one. Thank you for watching. We'll be back very soon with more Autogar Heroes.